Okay, everybody, I think we're uh, going to make a start. So welcome. It's great to have you with us for the launch of Building for a Healthy Life, uh, the latest edition of and the new name for Building for Life, 12. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Leo Hammond. I'm chair of the Urban Design Group. You can bring I'm up also your... Urban Design Associate Director at Lambert Smith, Hampton. I'm delighted to welcome our biggest online audience to date out there in the webosphere. We have almost 500 people registered for today's event and people joining us from all around the world. Looking through the delicate list, uh, we've got a great range of people joining us today from local authorities, government departments, developers, members of the public and some local councillors. So welcome everybody. So, a little bit, little bit of history here. Building for Life 12, for those of you that don't know, was launched in 2012. At a time where we were coming out of a global credit crisis and where the government's focus on design quality was, let's say, different to what it is today. Today, it is the country's most well-known and well-used design toolkit, I think it's fair to say, and we're delighted to be hosting this event. I think it's fair to say that Building for Life 12 has gone from strength to strength. It's cited in the National Planning Policy Framework, the NPPF, the National Design Guide, and this new edition has been supported by Homes England, NHS England, and NHS Improvement. Very important in these days, I'm sure you'll appreciate. Building for Life 12 was published in Welsh by the Welsh Government and the Des Design Commission for Wales, so I expect we will see a Welsh edition of Building for a Healthy Life very soon. Wales itself is making great strides in creating people-friendly streets. Just last week, the Welsh Parliament passed a national 20 mile an hour default speed limit. Speed limit. A world first, fantastic. Its task force group was chaired by Phil Jones, who joins us today. You'll hear from Phil shortly. Um, at the free conference the Urban Design Group ran a fortnight ago on towns and cities for children, we learned that children have great difficulty in judging the speed of oncoming traffic travelling at more than 20 miles an hour. They may amazingly actually think that the vehicles are stationary. This research finding should make us all think hard as to whether we're discharging what is really our legal duty of care to children if we create urban environments where traffic goes faster. 20 miles an hour. The Urban Design Group, uh, who I'm representing, have endorsed Building for a Healthy Life as part of its purpose to improve the quality of places across the country and, dare I say, across the world. And if you've not already done so, you can download a copy of Building for a Healthy Life from the Urban Design Group website. We'll also send a link around later. Save it, enjoy it, share it. So a little bit about the format for uh, this lunchtime event. It's essentially um, a game of two halves, if you will. The first half is a series of short presentations. Uh, the second half is where we'll open up the floor to you. In fact, the floor is now open, so you can use the chat bar to post your questions and we'll get through as many as we possibly can before we close at 2 p.m. and we can always follow up after whether at future events or get back in contact. If your question is targeted for a particular person on the panel, please make this clear your question. So I'm very pleased to have all the authors of Building for a Healthy Life here on today's lunchtime session. We've got David Birkbeck, Stefan Krasowski, Phil Jones, Sue McGlynn and Dave Singleton. Many of you will know Sue McLean, co-author of Responsive Environments, of course, and recipient also of a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Urban Design Group. It's great to have Sue with us. You're also going to hear from David Birkbeck and Phil in the first half of the event. Stefan, Sue and David Singleton will join later in the session and we'll get, in, get involved in the question and answers. We're also joined, I'm pleased to say, by Julie Tanner, representing the Nationwide Design Network, and Nigel Longstaff from Barrett Developments. In this world of the new Zoom normal and Zoom etiquette, which I'm sure we're, we're very much in favour by now, um, but just as a polite reminder, I'd ask you to stay on mute for the opening parts of the session to help our speakers um, um, when they're going through their presentations, and then we or you can unmute yourselves for the Q&A later on. So, Quite enough from me. Um, let's get on uh, with the game, as it were. Our first speakers are David Birkbeck and Phil Jones, who were part of the team that created Building for a Healthy Life. OK, 
Good afternoon. That's David to begin with. And I'm just going to show you a slide that was taken, this photograph of a street on the edge of Cambridge, classic development, edge of town. They do actually have quite good sustainable transport links in the Cambridge area. But the big focus of the scheme, and the reason why it's always interested me, is it actually has proper functioning streets. Many of them are straight. You can see where you're going. They have wide footways. They have trees. And there are places where people will actually run across the road feeling quite safe in doing so because of things like raised tables. And you can see the, the energy in this photograph. People really do walk around the place here. They walk to the shops, at this big waitress to the edge, they walk to the church, you can see in the background, and they walk to the park and ride to get into the city center. It's quite a revelation for a scheme like that. There just aren't that many of them. And this is me trying to access a housing development in Romford, leaving the railway station and heading down a half metre wide strip by the side of a dual carriageway where cars go at 40 miles an hour and where there's this uh, classic railing to stop you from getting from one side of the road to the other. This is the big challenge we face. We build railway stations and we build housing developments and then we build a series of, of effectively barriers and problem areas between them so that people do not naturally walk from one to the other. It takes a, a certain amount of luck to get down one of these streets without anything happening to you, which is uncomfortable. And um, we, we use this picture in the guidance just to remind people of what we're trying to avoid. It's written in partnership with Homes England and with NHS England and NHS Improvement. Those two organizations work in a tandem with each other. It's part of the NHS England strategy of trying to get people moving and it was actually unveiled in a select committee in parliament in january of 2019 so it's been a plan for a while but it really got going in about november over the winter there are lots of meetings between homes england between nhs england nhs improvement and also with other organizations notably mhclg and you can see the various partners are already part of this and and this group will get bigger and we're you know we're very delighted to have their support and we know that the way these things work is everybody gets to be involved everyone gets a share of the action and then you don't need big chunks of grant from central government um homes england if you don't know them it's the government agency that's tasked with accelerating housing delivery in england they actually have something like a 27 billion budget over five years so it's it's major and one of the things it does is it buys up tricky sites and packages them up with with a design brief and sells them on um, it started to insist that anybody bidding for those sites, if they come off the, what they call their development partner panel, that they cannot win those sites unless they can achieve building for life quality. And that's a really big thing for them because they're actually saying to the likes of Red Row, you know, we're happy to work with you, but you need to change your practice if you want to work with us. And they don't even look at the financial bid until they've got some proof of the fact that these bidders will be able to achieve building for life. We've been involved in teaching a lot of the people in, in evaluating those bids to show how they would potentially assess the schemes. And Homes England has agreed that it will now move as well from the original Building for Life 12 to Building for a Healthy Life. And it is its preferred measure of design quality. It's, it's a core document. It's something that they all work with and they know it very well. Um, and Building for a Healthy Life is there effectively to deliver some spade work for the key policy documents in the area. So you've got the National Planning Policy Framework, which it's referenced in. You have the National Design Guide, which it's referenced in. But the guides tend to read a little bit like the old by design. You might remember right back in 2001, we had a, an excellent document called by design that kickstarted really uh, the support for urban design again in house building. But you needed a series of follow on documents to actually deliver on several of the key principles it proposed. And building for a healthy life is very much a follow-on document to these other key government documents as one way of helping people to achieve them. And um, just one thing people don't necessarily understand, it does evolve. We, we try almost to create an annual edition of it. So it began in 2012, and you can see there was a 14, a 15, two issues in 15, because there's one in Wales as well, a 16 issue, an 18 issue, and now a 20 issue. So it will evolve again. And essentially, we're always open to any comment where people say there might be a better way of saying something or showing something. 
But the Healthy New Towns programme has ended. It was a three-year initiative that was run by NHS England. They supported some of the largest developments in England and they were checking out what you would need in order to deliver on this idea of getting people to become healthier through the environments in which they lived. We've taken on board those principles. Several of them are embedded into the document very clearly. And the biggest issue for them was that 41% of adults aged between 40 and 60 have literally stopped walking. They're no longer connected to anything they can walk to. And that's because of the lack of things like connections, edge to edge connectivity. But that's a huge potential problem for NHS England. If we now got essentially two in five adults have stopped moving on their legs or on their bikes. And you can know, you will know where that's going to take us. So that's a key part of it. But the other big area is the Environment Act, which is why Dave Singleton's been working with us, because he's very over this particular agenda of sustainable urban drainage, the way we need to green our developments in order to make them support by net biodiversity gains. There isn't a lot more to the changes than the fact that we have expanded on this idea of active travel and on nature. And if you actually look at the actual original document and the new document, you'll see it's still three sections integrating into the neighborhoods, now become integrated neighborhoods, creating a place has now become distinctive places. Street and home has now become streets for all. Many of the key criteria are still there, slightly different. Obviously facilities and the services, we're now saying walking, cycling and public transport to facilities and services. You know, can you get to them any other way than in your car? And if you go down the list there, you'll see there's some new ones. The green and black blue infrastructure one is obviously to do with the Environment Act. But generally, this is 90% the same as before. It's just it's pictures now rather than questions. And here's an example. If you ask questions of, of people say, you know, have you done this? Have you done that? They're going to say yes. And we've been told that repeatedly that people will argue, you know, white is black and black is white. So now we're beginning to illustrate what we actually mean by the questions that we used to ask. You can see good practice on the green pages. You can see bad practice on the red pages. There are more than 175 images in this guidance. Um, the last issue was about 20. And there's a lot of very detailed shots of small items that Phil will pick up in a minute because it's the little things that keep going wrong. So NHS has paid for this. And you know, think of it in terms of what its key objective is, is to make the public realm part of your daily exercise, essentially using streets some form of exercise routine it's got a lot more greater focus therefore on active travel edge to edge connectivity is obviously key to being able to walk anywhere and it's that's what's going to improve people's health and well-being as well of course as air quality because the one area where we're getting more car journeys is in the short journeys everybody else is beginning to cut back on the long haul journeys but we keep pushing higher and higher this number of little shuttles to go and buy a pint of milk or pick somebody up from school um, we are particularly keen to know who is using it. It's very difficult for us to track which local authorities have got it embedded into their plan policy. We know there are more than 100, but we actually honestly don't know whether it's 178 or 148. So we need more information on that. Anyone who can help us with, that, with recording that, we'd be really keen to. And there will be a, a substantial training program in the autumn and the winter when everybody will get a chance to catch up with a new focus and understand one or two of its, its new priorities. Now I'm gonna hand over in a second to Phil Jones, who I think has to be congratulated this week, of all weeks, for being part of this, because he has just helped Wales introduce a 20 mile an hour speed limit that should become law at some point next year. And that's, that's a massive change to the focus of everything we do. So Phil, as one of the authors of Building for a Healthy Life, and as the key person behind that 20 mile an hour speed limit, would you like to continue? Thanks, David. So just to, before I get into the detail, just a little bit of uh, background before we start. Um, Manual for Streets has, I think, taken on increased importance in the redrafting of Building for a Healthy Life. But just to say that, uh, obviously, it does refer to the existing edition of that. Um, as, as Robert's put on the chat, there is a problem with that that hasn't been taken up perhaps as widely as it should have been, even though it's now 13 years old. But there is a, um, a, an intention, CIHT uh, has received a grant from the Department for Transport and intends to uh, shortly commence the process of updating Manual for Streets and bringing together 
Manufacturing Streets 1 and 2, and the, the intention at the moment is to have that ready for publication early in 2022. So the document will grow, will be strengthened, and, and hopefully will um, uh, receive greater attention than it has done in the past. Um, just to mention, though, in parallel with that, um, we're working with Homes England, and David's part of the team on that, to produce what we're calling a street design and adoption code. So a little more detailed document, almost um, uh, the relationship of, of building for life or building for healthy life with the national design code or national design guide. Um, we see this this piece of work as, as um, uh, building on some of the details in the current version of Banning for Streets. Uh, and we're looking for case studies and, and good practice examples of, of streets that we can build on. So there's an email address there where my colleague Annabelle um, can, can um, will be very pleased to receive examples. But just to say, yes, Money for Streets is, is crucial. So he's, I think it's taken on increased importance in the redraft um, for the reasons that David mentioned about the importance of walking and cycling. It feeds into um, three of the 12 considerations, as you can see there, connect, connections, walking, cycling, public transport and, and healthy streets. But I think it's also fair to say that, that it influences quite a few other of the considerations, for example, easy to find your way around and, and um, streets for all. So it is fundamental to the document. Um, and just, just to touch on one of the details, there's lots of uh, detail that we need to get right, but one that is consistently got wrong uh, in development, it's, it's just common practice, as, as you know, David said, that we are building um, developments that are walkable externally, even when you get into the development, uh, they're, they're not as walkable as they should be. So we're building roads for cars, we, we're failing to adhere to that user hierarchy that's in manual for streets, and particularly we are building these wide and, and sweeping corner radius junctions of six meter radius and more, that it just from the, the very beginning of the development, um, uh, fails to say that this is a place primarily for pedestrians to encourage people to walk. The, um, the, the scheme on the top there is in Northamptonshire, um, I mean, huge junction to cross. And, and the one on, on the bottom is in Derbyshire. If I tell you that that access only serves seven dwellings and yet look at the size of the junction, it is just uh, un unnecessary. And what we see the green looks like are, are these kinds of schemes that we are seeing in some developments where pedestrians and cyclists just have that priority over side road junctions. Uh, and it's relatively rare at the moment, but it needs to become much more common if we are to deliver on, on the promise of, of building for a healthy life. Um, and, and none of this is new. This, is, this diagram is in the current manual street, so it was there uh, in 2007. And it just says that um, uh, if, you, if you want people to be able to walk, to have an element of priority, to make it easier to cross side roads where vehicles are going slowly, you need small corner radius, smaller than the six meter, um, that is commonplace on, on new development. So they're just a little taste of one of the details that we have to get right. Of course, there are many others as well that hopefully are explained in uh, clearer detail in the new document. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, um, David and Phil. Um, just before we crack on everybody, a um, quick bit of housekeeping. Um, I wonder if people could turn off their cameras if possible. Just This is going to help our speakers because it's going to reduce the bandwidth uh, for the event by having a camera. So if you could just turn it off, that would be great. Right, carrying on. Um, what strikes me most, just an ob as an observation about building for a healthy life, is the use of great images. I've got it on my third screen up here with some excellent urban design schemes. And what is urban design after all? If we can't communicate in clear pictures, images and diagrams. Uh, the images in Building for a Healthy Life are really useful in understanding what each of the 12 principles are getting at and conversely what should be avoided. Um, I like playing a game where I choose where I'd li most like to live on sort of the green and the good precedence pages. And there's some fantastic stuff in there, some fantastic schemes. And also there are some shockers as well. I also like playing a game where I'd least like to live on some of the bad practice pages. So I don't know what you think. Uh, perhaps you could let us know on the chat bar. So carrying on with our event, we're now gonna hear from Nigel Longstaff, Group Urban Design Director at Barrett Developments. 
Barrett are a member of the Home Builders Federation, the HBF. You'll notice the HBF logo on the back of Building for a Healthy Life, a sign of their endorsement, which is great to see. Um, so I'm told that completions by Barrett fell during the last financial year by about 30% um, as a result of COVID. Um, but all of their sites are now back open, which is good to see as many of us here uh, rely directly, indirectly maybe, on the house building industry. Perhaps their focus on design is part of their resilience and why sales have remained strong for them. We'll find out from Nigel. Um, so it's fantastic that we've got Nigel here today to tell us how Barrett have used the design principles contained within Building for a Healthy Life to improve the quality of the places they create. So Nigel, over to you. Right, uh, thanks very much, Leo. Um, hopefully everybody can see me, um, trusting technology here. And also, hopefully you will be able to see the slide. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks very much for that introduction, uh, Leo. Um, this is a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour through um, through the history, I, I suppose, of, of Barrett Developments. Um, our, our timeline here starts back in 2009, um, where we had various various elements of best practice within our company. Uh, also, inherent knowledge of uh, the old Building for Life 20, as I, as I call it. Um, so uh, it, it all really started off with our chief executive at that time, Mark Clare, uh, and a visit he had out to uh, a, a site with Richard Simmons, who was the, uh, the CEO of Cave at that time. And they went out to see some sites, probably uh, chosen very wisely. And the, the message that came back in a time, you know, just coming uh, going through recession, was that we need to be better. We need to create something uh, in terms of design and placemaking. We, uh, we created what was known as Q17 at that time. So it took questions out of our own best practice and, and also building for life. And that ran for a number of years. Then, as David said, that 2012, building for life 12 was brought out. And the, uh, the, the exec decided to uh, get us to review uh, our existing uh, uh, process Q17 and, and bring in something else. So what we decided to do was bring in great places. Now, great, great places aligns with Building for Life 12. It is the same 12 questions. A number of people ask why, why we have both. And the reasoning behind that is we use Building for Life as a tool for negotiation, discussion, whether that's landowners or local authorities. And then with great places, we have an annual design uh, uh, process where we have divisions submitting all of our completed schemes and we go through a process of judging those. Um, I suppose in terms of how things have moved on over the years, Q17, we had about eight submissions across the group. Uh, great places last year, we had 85 submissions. Uh, we also set a, 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 a target across the group that by 2020, all developments will achieve at least the silver standard. Uh, so we have silver and gold standard within the process. And last year, 93% of all developments achieved that, that standard. So I like to think we've come a hell of a long way over, over the years. Then, as David said, you know, the, the, the uh, Building for Life has gone through a number of different changes. Certainly the, the, the new one, yeah, graphically, it's very, very good. And, and hopefully it will be a tool to actually take things forward. We've updated our own great places now and included additional question on health and well-being uh, because we feel this is something that needs to be brought into our design process. And that will take into account green spaces and how we deal with connectivity to health and services. In addition to that, briefly, we have our own best practice documents, our blotting books, which inform us of different toolkits we have available. Uh, do work with the uh, design review as well, we have done since uh, for many years now, certainly under the Building for Life banner. Uh, two images there are actually from our award winners. Uh, so we have two categories, we stand a category of non-standard multi-story. So a scheme up in 
in, uh, in Middlesbrough, which is the top one, and then Blackfriars Circus in, in, in London. Uh, so currently as a business, we stand at 93 Building for Life accreditations, and 20 of, 23 of those are actually outstanding. So uh, that's my very, very quick tour of it. So Leo, back, back to you. Thank you, Nigel. That really interesting stuff. We just had a quick Google search and see that the Great Places program features in your company's annual, rep annual report. So design is clearly way up the agenda um, at the top of your business, which is great. And it's where it needs to be across the industry. Um, so um, also just having a look at the um, chat bar as well. And it's getting going. And can I please encourage people to ask more questions? Great to have conversations on there. But if you could please um, put your questions, it's a great opportunity to direct a question to Sue McGlynn and uh, the other authors that we have with us. So, um, so if you could get your questions going, that'd be great. Now, I'm pleased to welcome Julie Tanner from the Design Network. The Design Network is a group of locally based organizations that can support you whether you're a local authority, developer, or a community group in preparing a neighbourhood plan. So, Julie, over to you. Oh, I beg your pardon, I was muted. <laughs> Um, sorry, I'm Julie Tanner from the Design Network and I'm here to represent the seven not-for-profit organisations that uh, work across England and the map on your screen shows our distribution um, from the northeast through to the, the southwest. Uh, we are not-for-profit as I said, so we are an independent facilitator. We're best known for the delivery of design review but also we've been working for the last 10 years or so on Building for Life and we feel it's the right product really to facilitate the necessary conversation on, um, on, on better, better homes and better communities. Um, just to give you a brief overview of um, who you can contact across the design network, we're all locally based and we all have local panels of, um, of experts, whether they be urban designers, architects, landscape architects, surveyors, et cetera, et cetera. We put multidisciplinary teams together. Um, but with Building for Life and the new Building for Healthy Life, it's, um, it's obviously about bringing the right people together around the table. Um, so the landowner, the house builder, the local authority and the right panel. Um, who know the the locality and can be pragmatic about the the delivery of homes in in that area. And the type of work that we do um, and have been doing on building for life and already work has commenced on building for a healthy life. We've had some recent commissions on that already. Um, is to is to facilitate that conversation with the house builder about how they can achieve more greens on the on the 12 considerations and how we can signpost to um, to delivering that so it's not just an assessment on a completed scheme that's received planning permission potentially it's also about that early conversation and we always advise that you come as early as possible um, and engage with us to to help with the delivery of that training is also key and vitally important. We have trained um, quite a number of local authorities who have since gone to put Building for Life in their local plans and they are um, they're delivering their own Building for Life assessments in-house. So that's my very quick overview of who we are and obviously looking forward to the Q&A a bit later if anybody has any questions for me. Thank you, Julie, uh, uh, and thanks to all the speakers so far. I'm Stefan Krutskowski. I'm one of the co-authors of Building for a Healthy Life. So it's my job to be chairing the question and answer session uh, this, this lunchtime. So as you know, we've got all of our speakers on hand, um, and we're also going to be welcoming Sue McGlynn and David Singleton to the discussion. We've, we've had quite a few questions come in, so we're, we're filtering through those. And we'll get onto those in a moment. So we're going to get through as many questions as possible. And there's a perfect opportunity here to ask you questions. So if you haven't asked a question, 
don't be shy, put it forward. I'm going to be reading out the questions on your behalf so you can um, ask as many questions as you wish. So I'm going to go to the, uh, the question bar we've got set up and where possible, I'm going to direct it to uh, one of the participants of, of this, uh, this event this morning. So the first one here, uh, what do you think is the biggest difference between building for a healthy life compared to building for life 12? So um, Sue, would you be willing to answer that one? Oh, hello, yes, Stefan, I will. Yes, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I suppose for me, I think that David and Stefan have managed to produce with the partners a really powerful, visually powerful document. I think what it does is it condenses the really important design principles and combines them with a whole sequence of very telling images about what we want to achieve and what we want to avoid. And I think it, it does that really succinctly and bearing in mind it's such a concise document, it really packs it in. I think the second one for me is, um, we've all been aware, all of us, for a very long time of the importance of connected networks for human movement, mm -hmm. for integrating neighborhoods, for connections, for reaching the things we want to get to that I think David emphasized in his introduction. But I think the real step forward of this document is that it, it puts a new emphasis on the significance of flows and connections for natural systems. So obviously for water and green infrastructure and the really incredibly important role they play in um, making healthy integrated neighborhoods. And I think there are three key goals that, that emerge from that. The, the first is um, that we're going to have to, you know, from the, the clues in the environment bill, we absolutely have to um, enhance biodiversity. And the environment bill prefigures a 10% net gain. We, I think, by the combining of human movement and natural movements, connections can um, really create very characterful new places, really distinctive and char characterful new places. And then finally is the, you know, the, the biophilia argument, which is, you know, really does enhance people's sense of well-being in the places they live and the neighborhoods that they live. So I think the combination of those two things, for me, are a real step forward of this document from all the good work that's been done in the, you know, the previous, previous years. Thank you, Sue. Um, we, we've got a couple of questions relating to green and blue infrastructure. So um, I'm going to be directing this to uh, David Singleton. Um, so we've got two questions here, Dave. So um, the first is, would you see the design of blue and green infrastructure changing as a result of building for a healthy life? And the second one is, says, regarding building for a healthy life, what role do the panel see for planting edible landscapes and embedding edible planting into the urban fabric? If they don't see a role, what are the barriers to this? I regularly install edible landscapes alongside housing developments and local authorities, which is witnessing huge health and community benefits for residents. So I think there's quite a few questions there, Dave. Well, but, uh, perhaps you might want to tackle that one. Uh, yeah, do I see design changing uh, as a result of this? I hope so. Um, I mean, we see lots of really good design of blue and green infrastructure, of course, and and SUD standards in Wales and forthcoming SUD standards in um, that sustainable drainage system standards in England um, will add to that, I think. Um, what I see as the main change really is is both qualitatively and uh, quantitatively but centrally about multifunctional spaces so this isn't just about providing public open space because it's inherently good it's about thinking a great deal more about what that multifunctional space might do what those functions might be so um, you know introducing the idea of biodiversity gain and gain for people which Sue, Sue mentioned so just more thought applied to the quality of these sorts of spaces rather than simply having them um, uh, and, and, and having more of them. 
second question was on edible landscape stuff yeah yeah so um, what, what are the barriers um uh, i think one of the main barriers with creating places where people can eat uh, food is going to be how that space is managed and this is uh, a constant challenge for designing green and blue infrastructure thinking about the management of this stuff first rather than last uh, will determine a lot of the uh, degree of success um, really um, our experience is that if management is is very high up the agenda and community trusts are created or local authorities are adequately resourced to manage these spaces then they happen if that isn't the case then they're a lot less likely to happen frankly so um, there's no reason why edible landscapes can't uh, become more prevalent uh, and richer and more interesting and add to healthy places but it really is about thinking about how they're managed okay great thanks dave um i had a question about the paragraph in the mppf that building for healthy lives mentioned in but fortunately mike so thanks to mike for answering that paragraph 129 so we've answered that one um, we have a really interesting question here. Um, how does building for a healthy life sit with Secure by Design, which prioritises security over accessibility? Um, I obviously know that that's quite a challenge, but um, I'm going to see if Sue wants to answer that one. Sue? It, yes, I'm just done. Yes, yeah, thanks, Stefan. Uh, I don't particularly see that there's a conflict because I think... There's two views about how you uh, reduce antisocial behaviour. Um, I suppose the argument that we've always used is that good overlook of public spaces, both streets and green spaces, play spaces, is actually the way to engender good response to those places rather than turning back walls, blank walls and, and going for the kind of screening yourself from the world approach, which sometimes the the more, uh, I suppose, the older fashioned view of secured by design uh, probably advocated. I think the more recent guidance is, is actually about how you achieve security through more natural and physical means, which, which does involve through movement to people. You know, it's the Jane Jacobs argument that the mm. eyes on the street police the space and the eyes from the building police the street. So it is a two way, um, it's a two-way process and as long as you get that attention in the design right from the start between how you face and front buildings to public spaces and you don't expose private backs uh, then I think you can achieve an awful lot of those principles um, by having connected systems. Thank you Sue. Um, we'll get to quite a few questions flooding in now so I'm trying to group thematic ones together um, so I'm going to direct these two to Julie from the Design Network. Um, how should a planning authority use building for a healthy life? And the second one is how important is it to have local knowledge about an area? Julie. Thanks, Stefan. Um, well, the, those local authorities where we've gone in and done some training and delivered some design review um, focused around building for life. They've then gone on to frame some of their pre-application discussions around building for life. So it's almost like um, a menu of, of issues that they can raise with, with the developers. And um, the golden thread that's referred to in um, building for a healthy life is absolutely fundamental to get that design or even sustainability or functional type discussion in at the very earliest opportunity when you can engage with your landscape officer, your highways officer, your biodiversity officer, um, et cetera, et cetera. The question on, um, on why local, fundamentally new housing development has its greatest impact in its locality. It's not a sub-regional issue. Um, it's not a regional issue and it's not a national issue when it comes to those who are living in, in their homes. So we, um, we think it's extremely important that we bring local expertise into a locality because they understand the market conditions and they understand the, the market trends and they can be pragmatic and knowledge of you know local authority policy and development plan policy is is really crucial because 
you, you not only bring the design team into the room, but you also bring the landowner into the room. So they are challenging, you know, how well their design team is responding to their brief. Um, but also you're bringing the local authority. And sometimes we're increasingly we're getting elected members to come in and observe these discussions because they are the community representatives at the end of the day. And, you know, they have to go back and justify the release of what may be a very precious piece of, of greenfield land so that's that's why i think local is best and um yeah we've we've seen some really good outputs as a result of of that delivery thank you julie uh we're also getting some interesting um observations and comments on the chat bar so i'm, go I'm going to read one out uh, it's from esther carumba who uh, is in India. So hi Esther, great to have you joining us. She says a manual is so thorough, hoping to see similar guidelines in India soon. Esther, if you want to uh, work with us and launch Building for a Healthy Life in India, drop us an email, info at designforhomes.org. We'll be delighted to work with you. Um, a few questions about street design. Um, so um, Phil, I think you're the chap for this. Mm -hmm. um, we've got lots of questions about, well, when is manual for streets going to become mandatory? Mm -hmm. Why are so many highways authorities resistant to manual for streets, which frustrates the efforts of local planning authorities mm -hmm. to apply the ideas in healthy streets? How are we communicating with county highways departments? Why do they dismiss manual for streets? How can we get them on board when they're so obsessed with vehicle first design? So quite a few questions there, Phil, but I think the, the general theme and thrust of these questions is the same. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's interesting. Um, the original Manual for Streets, um, when it was produced, it, it, we moved away from, uh, or deliberately moved away from DB32, which was very number specific, number heavy and, and very rigid and, and tried to allow highway authorities and highway engineers to a, a little more latitude to think about how to do good design um, and and perhaps with hindsight we kind of move the move the, um, the pendulum too far and, and i think you can see it in the new building for healthy life we're we're trying to come back now and saying what does good actually look like and and let's let's be clearer about it and, and use imagery to say this is good this is not good um, and the new manual for streets that's very much the intention so um, work hasn't begun yet, but there was a, a, an interesting webinar last week, which CIHT um, led on. I don't know if people tuned into that, but um, uh, it, it, what was talked about was that there's going to be much stronger engagement with the planning inspectorate to, to bring them on board so that when, when ultimately if, if um, the sides go to appeal, that the inspector understand the importance of manual for streets. Um, but there'll be a much stronger uh, comms campaign to promote the use of the doc document. Um, what they called a robust stakeholder engagement strategy. So I think there, there's a recognition that much more needs to be done um, to to bring the profession or professions along and explain why this is necessary. And I think I think perhaps an, um, the experience of, of, of COVID and the, and the pandemic is has just brought it, it home that we 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 cannot continue to um, to build our, our, our new housing areas around the car that w for all kinds of reasons personal health, air quality, congestion, road safety, this has to happen. And, and I think we hopefully we can look forward to government um, taking a more robust approach to requiring the use of manual for streets and strengthening uh, decision makers and ultimately the, the appeal system if, um, if, if applicants and, and let's be said, highway authorities do not, do not comply with it. Okay, that, thanks Phil. Um, few other questions and observations. Uh, where's the document? You can find it on the Urban Design Group's website. If you just go to udg.org.uk, top left hand side, latest publications, you can see it there. Um, moving on to some of the other questions. Um, I'm going to pose this to David Birkbeck. Where is the stick to use this document? <laughs> well, I think the stick idea has always been the wrong one because if you're a publicly quoted house builder and you get beaten up, you fight back. I always think it's easier to work with carrots. I think the biggest carrot around is the 27 billion program that Homes England manage for land and grant for house building. 
And if they're saying they'll only work with those companies that appear to be able to achieve the standards within building for a healthy life, I think that's a massive carrot, especially at this moment when no one can afford to start any schemes, build the roads, build the infrastructure because their balance sheets have just taken a hammering. The idea there's a public sector landowner out there that's willing to work with you, if you're willing to work to its design standards, is about as powerful as it gets. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, David. Um, question here. Um, I, I think this is uh, going to be directed to Nigel. Um, Nigel, do you think taking a positive approach to design as a company affects the company's bottom line, either positively or negatively? Um, and can you point to any evidence of the economic benefits um, associated with Barrett adopting a more design focused approach? Um, I couldn't possibly comment on the, on the bottom line, but I think what I'd like to say is that there's consistency across our board in terms of uh, their, 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 their understanding and their commitment to, to design and placemaking. Um, I think everybody actually realises since we, since we brought in this, this process that when you design a place effectively, you, de you design it well, there is, there is potential to get, uh, from a, a legacy point of view, an awful lot of pos positivity out there from, from landowners all the way through to local authorities and then on to members of the public. Um, I don't think it's difficult when people walk onto developments and see that it's designed right, that it is a desirable, desirable place to live. Uh, you, you would hope that that would, that would ultimately bring in value. You know, I think good design does bring in value, but I can't actually bring any figures into that, that, that equation. But I think it's the commitment, it's the culture, it's actually doing things right. But there's an awful lot of stakeholders involved in that process. Okay. Thank you, Nigel. Um, few on um, biodiversity net gain. Uh, so this, this will go to Dave Singleton. Um, how do we assess 10% biodiversity net gain? Do we know what we have and therefore what gain should be? Easy to clear the site first, then it is all gain. Um, and another, another point on, on this one, slightly related, is uh, oh, it's a really interesting one. What should the green infrastructure of the future look and function like? Mm -hmm. So putting you on the spot, David, with these. Yeah, um, biodiversity net gain is um, enshrined in uh, measurement techniques. So there is something called the, the uh, DEFRAMETRIC2. Uh, I don't claim to be an ecologist and an expert in this, so uh, consulting an ecologist would be a good idea, somebody who does this for a living. Um, but it is related to habitat quality. It's not, uh, unlike um, previous biodiversity metrics, like uh, the one used in BRIAM, which would concentrate, say, on floristic diversity and numbers of species, um, modern metrics are uh, 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 designed to measure um, not just that, but also the quality of the habitats and the connectivity of the habitats. 10% is, is talked about, but it's about working through spreadsheets um, to uh, assess a baseline and then see how that baseline can be improved on, typically as a minimum of 10%. Uh, of, of so the other question was, was related about um, ask a question about the green infrastructure of the, the future. Um, my view is that uh, there shouldn't be such a thing as green infrastructure. It should be blue-green infrastructure. And, and we make that point in the, uh, in the document. So anything that's green has to have, again, in my view, a, a blue component. These things have to become multifunctional. So it's about making sure that any spaces that are being created as part of a blue-green infrastructure network are connected. Sue's talked about the importance of that. And that they have value over and above simply one function. Uh, and this has health benefits, doesn't it, in, in terms of the sort of mental health benefits that the presence of nature has for people. So these things just don't operate simply as movement corridors for creatures. They're also movement corridors for people. They have a 
function uh, as regards things like carbon capture, um, edible landscapes being measured, so that uh, mentioned, so they, they would um, incorporate potentially some kind of food production. Uh, and they would be just pleasant places to be for a variety of, of uses. So in the future, the great and glorious future, um, that's, what, uh, that's what I'd envisage. Thank you. Um, I've got a, a really sort of interesting question here. Uh, and I don't know which of the panel members I'm going to uh, direct this to, so I'm going to leave it open. Is the production of new progressive design guidance actually counterproductive? Does it serve as a distraction activity, keeping busy a bunch of people who might otherwise be more vocal and active and challenge the car-dominated profit-focused status quo? So many excellent guides, so little progress. So who, who might be willing to um, offer some views on that? Julie. I agree. Sorry. <laughs> it's, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, no, well, we very often have um, quite uh, a battle with developers to try and justify design-led approaches you might appreciate. And I always um, talk about the situation where, you know, there's about 15 suits in the room and they're all sitting with their arms folded by the end of the design review panel. You know, they're active and they're writing and their shoulders are down and they're, they're animated and um, they absolutely see the benefit of, of a bit of scrutiny and, and a bit of collaboration and a bit of challenge. So there, there is a real um, focus on the local authority to try and join all of these pieces together and for planners to plan and, you know, and um, for local authorities to generate income from their land holdings and go into joint ventures and, and, and everything else. So it is a very complicated picture um, and not everybody's doing it right. But I think the benefit of having some you know, design guidance on the design code type framework such as BHL is, is really significant and really important. And, um, you know, if we can get better design and access statements, if we can get better corporate policy, and if we can get people to talk more clearly about the economic uplift that can be associated with good value and sustainability, I think that's that's really key. Another aspect that hasn't been mentioned, which I think, which I'm really interested in and at the minute, particularly in this post COVID or, you know, in this COVID world that, that we're currently in is social value. And I think the um, BHL also has um, parallels with, you know, creating better social value, whether that's through, you know, um, improving cycle and walking networks, you know, planting where, where you can pick your own fruit in the autumn, this type of thing. So all of these sort of added extras and what makes for, for better quality life, whether it be through play or um, leisure time or whatever, whatever it may be. Thank you, Julie. On, on that, that point, I was, well, David, you read my mind. I thought you were going to put your hand up. Um, I, 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 we've had a few sort of points about COVID and how does building for a healthy life respond to COVID and whatever the new normal may be? Yeah, it's very sensitive, isn't it, to produce a piece of guidance during an era where so many people have had such a dreadful time and appear to provide an answer for it all. Uh, you know, we don't have that. But what we are clearly proposing is three or four things that are in the guidance that effectively work just as well for dealing with, with situations like we've just been through. So obviously having footways that are big enough to pass each other without necessarily having to breathe each other's breath, that's really important at the moment. And that goes for apartment buildings as well. We've got examples of apartment buildings, low rise and medium rise, with access galleries and access decks rather than enclosed 1200 mil corridors. Because people living in apartments serving, served by 1,200 mil double bank corridors at this moment are very uncomfortable with their neighbours and the other people perhaps they don't even know within the block on upper levels and lower levels. So there are, there are some prompts and ideas on how we deal with that. And I think they will overlap with some of what Julie suggested. I would like to say that, I mean, the, the point that Tim Gill's made about, does, you know, is this guidance itself essentially just wasting the energy of people who could be making a, um, an impact in some way. I think those, those kind of questions are hugely valid. The, the thing I would say is you ought to be quite strategic 
you know, if you've got councillors sat around the planning committee uh, talking to people about planning applications and you bring something up, which is about things like air quality, the health of kids, uh, reducing traffic in the immediate vicinity and potentially providing ways of addressing some of the bigger challenges from COVID, then councillors will ask to see that implemented. And so that, you know, you just have to be very strategic. I think the NHS involvement is fantastic. I mean, strictly between ourselves, I know there's only about 382 of us in the room. NHS paid us virtually nothing to do this work, but we chose to do it because the NHS support means it'll go into a level of consciousness in councillors that anything MHCLG does could never, it just wouldn't ever have the same traction as NHS England. They have a budget which is literally 90 times the size and they're the key part of our country and they're probably the strongest brand we have so working side by side with them was again very strategic for us and we think we'll hope will it will raise the guidance to somewhere that another guidance document might not achieve thanks david it's coming up to two o'clock so i've got to draw this question and answer session to an end i hope you've all found it really interesting. I know we've got loads of questions we've not been able to answer. So I've seen that we've got questions from Joe, Luan, Gary, Warren, uh, and lots of other people. We're not actually going to just dismiss these questions. We're going to organize a sort of short after hours response. So when this video gets posted on Urban Oot, um, there'll be another video appearing where you'll see the building for life. Uh, building for a healthy life authors again and we will be answering all the questions that have been posted so we're not going to avoid any. Before I hand back to Leo, um, on behalf of the Building for a Healthy Life authors uh, we'd like to thank the Urban Design Group for hosting this. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes so thank you very much and over to Leo. Okay well just, uh, just to sum up then and to do a few thank yous as well and some upcoming events. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for this lunchtime launch. We don't take your company for granted. We hope you found it interesting. Sure you have. Um, and we hope that everyone everywhere utilises building for a healthy life. Create better places, not just here in the UK, but overseas, as we've heard as well. We at Lambert Smith Hampton have already started utilising the document for assessing as well as improving schemes. Just like I say, if you're a local authority and you already use uh, BFL 12 or thinking um, of adopting building for a healthy life, please drop a message to info at designforhomes.org. From October, there'll be a regional building for a healthy life events. These events will give you the opportunity to find out more about how the toolkit is being used in your part of the country. So if you're a local authority, developer or local community group or wondering whether you can make the toolkit work for you, tune into these online events to find out more. We'll be posting details of these events on the Urban Design Group website um, at the start of October. Today's event will be posted uh, to Urban Mouse and onto our Urban Design Group YouTube channel, where you'll find plenty of other events and talks that you may enjoy. Um, and I hope to see you at a future Urban Design Group event. We've got loads going on. We've been running a regular series called Idea Space every Thursday. Maybe a few of you um, have seen that or, or asked questions on it. This week's session is on decarbonising transport. Next Thursday's session is on the regeneration of Glasgow. And all of our previous events are on our YouTube channel. We also have our conference coming up in September, which this year we're running jointly with the Academy of Urbanism. Everyone is welcome. And finally, for today, thanks to our guest speakers, Julie Tanner and Nigel Longstaff. Uh, thanks to you and also thanks to the Urban Design Group crew of Robert Huxford, Esther Southey and Jacqueline Swanson for the behind the scenes work um, that they've done to make this whole event work and go to plan. So thank you to you guys. And most of all, thanks to you uh, for turning up and tuning in today on your lunchtime. So go out, enjoy the sunshine if you can and goodbye and we hope to see you soon. Goodbye.